Welcome back to our Quantum Future with Jack Hittery. This is a subject that most people find very, you know, esoteric and confusing. And you do a beautiful job of making Thanks, it understandable. Peter. And I think one of the things that's critical for these modules for our, our digital entrepreneurs here is helping them understand that's not just sort of something you read about and it's theoretical, that this is going to have real applications. This is going to change what's possible in the world. It's going to change our lives in so many ways. So in this module, it's about sensing and communications. Let's, let's dive in, Jack. That's correct. In fact, Peter, quantum mechanics is already impacting our lives today. Uh, fMRI, functional MRI scans, PET scans, positron emission tomography, that's all quantum phenomenon. Those were developed by physicists. And what's really funny is, for example, MRIs, we call them MRIs in hospitals today, the original name was NMR, Nuclear Magnetic Resonance. Sure. But when they brought it to a hospital, people freaked out. Nuclear. Nuclear, <laughs> uh-oh. And so they changed it, and that was kind of a great marketing campaign, right? <laughs> By GE and others, let's, no, let's call it MRI, Magnetic <laughs> Resonance Imaging. Resonance, it feels ah, good. Ah, <laughs> okay. So, Sensing so, and communications. Yeah. So we already have quite a, some of these sensors around today, but now let's dive into this. How do we actually make use of the quantum mechanical effects to sense things around us. And so I'll give you some examples. Um, let me first give you just an analogy before we dive into this uh, initial use case right here, which is, let's take a thermometer. Let's say it's hundreds of years ago and I say, Peter, my good gentleman friend, um, I want to tell you about a new invention I have. It's called the thermometer. And it can go from uh, this thing I'm going to call zero degrees, uh, say Fahrenheit, let's just use Fahrenheit for the moment, zero degrees Fahrenheit, and it goes up to 20 degrees Fahrenheit, and it goes in gradations of five degrees. That's what I can do. I can do these bunches of five, and that's what I have. I have four things, four lines on my thermometer, and you're like, well, Jack, Kind of a cool invention. Maybe I can use it for uh, when it's really cold out and you know I'll use it to uh, see if something's gonna become ice or something like that, but not particularly sensitive and not a particularly big dynamic range. Those mm -hmm. are the two things that it's really not very good at, right? Sure. It doesn't have a big range of detection and it also it's not very sensitive. It's only doing it in these big blocks of, of temperature. And then I came back to you a few years later and said, okay, you're right, good feedback, Peter. Thanks for that, <laughs> appreciate welcome. the feedback. I have a new thermometer. It goes from minus 400 to plus 400 in gradations of tenths of a degree. You're like, wow, that is a big leapfrog in sensing capabilities. That analogy I want to use now from classical to quantum regime of nice. sensing. And so in the classical way, we have all kinds of sensors, we have EKGs, we have EEGs, we have uh, all kinds of different phenomena that we can sense around us, magnetic fields and things like that, but we're limited because of the classical realm that we have these sensors in. In the quantum realm, we can go beyond that. Here's one use case right here in front of us. Okay. Seth Lloyd, in, um, back a number of years ago, wrote a paper in Science talking about what he called quantum illumination. And what he meant by illumination is not kind of a light source, but being able to detect something in a kind of a radar type format using quantum mechanics, not just classical radar. So we know radar is super valuable. It's kind of like a core thermometer, right, that we need. And, and so if you want, if in World War II, it was absolutely essential uh, to the British making sure they knew that the planes were coming and ultimately to many other um, applications there as well. And today we use it in airports around the world. But what if I told you that I can take the distance, let's call it X, between the radar tower and the airplane, and in the quantum realm, I can take that distance out to 5X or 10X in detection. Mm -hmm. You can imagine applications of this kind of quantum radar that would be quite significant. If I could know um, through the clouds and the fog that a plane was coming to an airport much farther away, we can probably you know, have a more safe, airport system and detection system and, and other, side, other kinds of applications. So this is one application of what quantum sensing is about, quantum radar. Let's look at another kind of quantum sensor right here. What we're looking at here is a, is a startup out of Colorado. I have nothing to do with the startup at all. I've never even met them. But QSpin is a company that is creating a quantum sensor. And that little black thing that you see there is the size of a ballpoint pen. So they took something that years ago used to be the size of a huge tabletop into a ballpoint pen. And there's a university in Nottingham that has taken about 30 of those ballpoint pen-like quantum sensors, put it in a kind of a bizarre cap mm. that people can find on their favorite search engine right now, and they're detecting brain activity using these quantum sensors. So what is that actually measuring? 
what it's measuring is small fluctuations in the magnetic field. So we know from physics that every time there's electricity on the move, electrons on the move, we call it electricity, that Faraday showed us that there's magnetism associated with that. And it's called the electric motor. Bingo. So what we know, if the brain has electricity, and it does, there must be an associated magnetic field with mm. it. And sure enough, there's a very large device that a handful of hospitals have out there, right, which is not an EEG, but an MEG, a magnetoencephalography, mm -hmm. right? So MEG instead of EEG. But those are very large devices that have to be kept super, super cold inside of them, and you stick your head in one of them, <laughs> and obviously you're not very mobile, right? So if we wanted to say, for example, follow somebody in their home and in their workplace um, and understand the tasks they're doing, that's not a very good device. It weighs two tons, costs millions of dollars. The, the MEG of today. But this kind of system here by the University of uh, Nottingham in their hands being used to maybe build an MEG of the future. Mm. And so this is another application where we want to detect very small changes in the magnetic field around us. And one of the things a quantum sensor can do is to do that kind of thing. And so you see some gas particles in there, you see a laser being shot into those gas particles, and that forms a quantum sensor that we can use to figure this out. So those are two applications right there of quantum sensing. We have a magnetic field, and in this case, it was a brain, and the Nottingham folks are using it to try to make a new kind of brain sensor for the brain activity that will be complementary to an EEG. Okay. Cool. So now let's turn to quantum communications. All right, why quantum communications? Well, if you and I were sitting here in 1969, we'd be talking about something called ARPANET. That is, a handful of locations around the United States initially, and ultimately globally. And initially, it was a couple of national labs. Uh, there were some universities involved. And they said, let's connect five or 10 of these universities in this, quote, internet, right? Why internet? Because it's an internetwork. It's a network of networks, therefore an internetwork. So if I have a network inside Stanford University and one at MIT, and I connect those two networks, I now have an internet. And so 1969 was the birth of what you and I know today as the internet. And we know the kind of implications and profound impact that the internet had. As we're sitting here today, a new kind of internet is being built right now. Mm. A number of universities, government institutions, and others are building on the East Coast and the West Coast, they're building out the new kind of internet, a quantum internet. An internet that does not transmit just normal signals, classical signals, but is able to transmit quantum signals. We talked about entanglement earlier in a previous module. We talked about how two particles, even far apart, could be entangled with each other, i.e. correlated with each other, such that when I measure one, the other one automatically goes into a certain state. Well, a quantum internet is a network that can maintain and transmit those quantum kinds of signals. Are they transmitting them by measuring two entangled particles? Or are they measuring something else? Right. So it depends on what we want to do with this quantum internet. We can do many different things with it. We'll measure in different ways and we'll transmit in different ways. But there are fundamentally two ways of thinking about how we build this network. Terrestrially with fiber and also with satellites. Hmm. And so let's take a look at some of this right now. What we see the Chinese doing right now is we're using satellites. They're also using fiber on the terrestrial ground. What is their satellite? Their satellite's called the Missius satellite. It's named after an ancient Chinese scholar. It costs probably upwards of six, seven hundred million dollars. It's up in the uh, sky right now. And what it does is it entangles two photons up in the satellite and transmits one to one ground station and one to another ground station. And the, the record for quantum entangled transmission prior to this satellite was 149 kilometers in the Canary Islands. Huh. They busted that record with 1,200 kilometers in their first attempt, and then more recently went and showed that between Beijing and Vienna, they can transmit a quantum entangled signal over 7,500 kilometers. Okay, so now the question is, what, Why? Good is, what are you gonna do with it? Yeah. What is it? Exactly. What's the meaning? What is going on here? Yeah. So let's use this term QSE, quantum secure communications, because okay. our viewers today are going to be hearing and reading a lot about QSE, about quantum secure communications. The fact is that, as we'll see in a later module today, Peter, Peter Shore, demonstrated that a quantum computer one day will break all the secure communication technologies that we have today. All, all encryption modes that the have existed. The encryption so mode, the main one that we use, known as RSA, mm -hmm. right? After Rivest, Shamir, and Edelman, 
RSA encryption, also known as public key cryptography, PKC. Mm -hmm. That's the generic word for what specifically is RSA. This kind of encryption that you and I are using on WhatsApp, that you and I are using on putting our credit cards up into Amazon, that you and I are using for payments bank to bank, and banks are using for interbank communications as well. All this kind of secure communications that all consumers use, billions of people around the world, will be cracked by quantum computers. Eventually, not yet. Not yet. Okay. Will be, one day. And so because of that, a number of countries and companies and others have realized it is time to figure out a means of transmission that is impervious to quantum computing attack. And the only thing that we know of that is impervious to quantum computing attack of cryptography is a quantum means of communication. A quantum encryption. Exactly. A quantum secure encryption. And that's what is happening right now on this satellite. The, the means of transmitting messages using this particular satellite cannot be cracked ever by any quantum computer now or in the future. It is not a question of size or scale of that quantum computer. The very laws of quantum mechanics itself mean, as we said before, measurement impacts the actual object in quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. And so if we were sitting in either an airplane or some drone next to that signal and we tried to measure that signal to intercept that signal, by the act of measurement itself, we'd be destroying the signal itself. So the best we can hope for is a denial of service attack. Sure, is The best we can hope for is to deny the signaling of that particular message, but all you have to do is have multiple of those machines transmit lots of messages around, and you'd get around that denial of service attack. A denial of service attack has to be successful 100% of the time. The sender only has to be successful one mm -hmm. out of the millions of times they send it. And so ultimately, they'll be able to get that message through. And so a quantum secure way of sending a message is a way of making sure that you're impervious to quantum computing attack. Now here is something that only recently have people begun to realize, SNDL. Why another abbreviation, Jack? I'll tell you why. Okay. <laughs> At least it's not a TLA. <laughs> it's a three-letter acronym. <laughs> it's exactly. So send now, decrypt later means what? It means that if you and I are wanting to uh, find each other's messages, and right now we're intercepting each other's RSA encrypted messages, right, yeah. using the normal protocols we have today. What I can do is I can store your messages, here's Peter's message here, and here's Jack's messages over there. Now we can't read them now, so what we do is we store them now, and one day when we have a quantum computer that we can actually use to crack them, we crack them and read them retroactively. Mm -hmm. So that retroactively, they were actually not secure. Now you might say, Jack, it might take years to, for us to get such a quantum computer. Well, yes, but there are some things worth knowing even years <laughs> later, right? So, in fact, if I'm transmitting some super secret formula for a new pharmaceutical or something like that, and you are industrial espionage coming from a certain place or country, and you want to intercept that, you may not be able to read it for many years, but once you read it, you'll have that information. And of course, government to government, that's also quite significant. So there are startups right now thinking about uh, beginning quantum encryption and making that available today. That's right. So what are they doing exactly? Well, prior to this super secure, what we call unconditionally secure, quantum secure communication, that is, it's not conditioned upon any lack of computational power or things like that, we have what's called quantum resistant communications. Mm -hmm. What is quantum resistant communication? Just really as it implies. It is not impervious to an attack by a quantum computer. However, it is resistant. So that it's kind of like a speed bump. If you were, if you and I wanted to burglarize a house, yeah. okay, and we had two houses to choose from. One has an alarm system, has that big ADT sign, one doesn't. Which one are we going to go for? The one that doesn't. Sure. And so quantum resistance is just that. It kind of like a speed bump that says to people with quantum computers, hey, don't look at that message. Go to the message that doesn't have the resistance <laughs> okay. you know, kind of thing. That's the place easier. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that's what some startups are doing today. Exactly. Okay, so let's move on. We talked about how they now demonstrated it from Beijing to Vienna. And here is the video transmission using quantum secure encryption with the video transmission happening right there. And this all relates to something we call quantum teleportation. Despite the fact that you and I are absolutely in love with Star Trek and have watched it since we were kids, um, this is not, unfortunately, that kind of teleportation. Uh, I could, I could <laughs> cross my fingers, but um, yeah. So we're not teleporting anything physical. We're not teleporting atoms. Here we're teleporting a state of information. 
that's still quite profound. And, and this is theoretically over any distance? Yeah, over any distance, right. And so the beautiful thing about quantum teleportation is this is a protocol that was developed years and years ago. This is not new. We knew how to do this for many years. But now we finally have the engineering to actually implement this over longer distances. Hmm. And so we can do it with a satellite. We can also do it over terrestrial lines. Right now, up to about 150 to 200 kilometers. After that, you need what we call a quantum repeater, which we don't have yet. And so that remains to be done in the future. Yeah. But quantum teleportation, I just want folks um, viewing this to really, you know, they'll, they'll start hearing about this term. Again, it's not teleporting anything physical. It is teleporting something that is a state. And so if I have an electron in state up and I want to transmit that to you uh, in a long distance, hundreds of thousands of miles away, or maybe even another planet, I can do so using quantum teleportation. And it, we can do that in a secure manner. Amazing. Okay. Amazing. So just to finish, we now can see that we can have a national or even global network of combinations of terrestrial and satellite, and that could form a global new kind of internet, a global quantum internet. And that is now in our near future, is to have not only the internet as we know it today, but a quantum internet right alongside that. What's your prediction? When are we going to see that first actually entering use? Well, the government, NSF and others have already given the first grants uh, to start enabling small pilots amongst various universities and national labs. So I expect both an East Coast and West Coast uh, small networks over the next two, three years. And I would say over the next five or 10 years, uh, this kind of network will be built out. Incredible. So quantum sensing is here. There are entrepreneurs building sensors. Startups out there right now. And quantum communications. I mean, I can imagine that this is fundamental to every government, fundamental to uh, the banking, the banking the system, banking, finance, everything, energy, utilities, anything that has to be secured in a really strong way will have to use these kinds of protocols, Peter. So it's 2030 when this becomes a baseline? I think by 2030, every major corporation and certainly governments will have to use this for their most sensitive information. Now, there'll be lots of other information that we continue to use, either traditional RSA or, as we just mentioned, quantum resistant protocols, where it's not as sensitive information. And so for our WhatsApp messages, probably no one really wants to spy on the fact whether we're going to dinner at a Thai place or a <laughs> Korean place. But the fact is that for more sensitive information, I think people will have to start moving to these kinds of protocols. Amazing. So that's it for this module. Where are we going in module number three? Module number three, we're now going to come to the core of quantum computing itself. We're going to dive into how do these computers work, what are they made of, and what kind of applications can we use them for? Amazing. So I hope you've enjoyed that. Uh, stay tuned and join us for module three on our quantum future. Jack, a pleasure. Thank you, Peter.